The subject of countless songs, novels, comics, and even appearing as a character in the TV show American Horror Story, her very name conjures images of black magic, strange rituals, and deadly curses. Marie Laveau basked in the notoriety of being the voodoo queen of New Orleans. Born in 1801, the high priestess was well known and both loved and revered, as well as inherently feared. But how much of her legend is real? And what are the facts in the life of this mysterious, majestic woman? In this installment of the Supernatural Tendencies podcast, we'll explore the truth to these strange and haunting tales and take a deeper look at the reported queen of voodoo. And stay tuned for this week's Musician Spotlight. This week, Booback. Thank you for joining us. I'm Christy. And I'm Alex. And this is Episode 14, Marie Laveau. The Big Easy provides the backdrop for one of the South's most enduring legends, and truth be told, the residents of New Orleans, Louisiana, have no doubt of her power, even from beyond the grave. Visitors from all over the world come to pay their respects, and ask for wishes to be granted by the state's most famous occupant, Marie Laveau. Occupying a lot in St. Louis Cemetery No. 1, Plot No. 347, her tomb is adorned with spiritual gifts, candles, money, and personal items, all in hopes of gaining favor with the powerful priestess. But how did this reported queen of voodoo become so well known? Her story begins in September of 1801, when she entered this world via parents, Marguerite Henry, a free woman of color who was of Native American, French, and African descent, and Charles Laveau Trudeau, a wealthy mulatto businessman and plantation owner. Young Marie grew up on her father's plantation and maintained her strict Catholic upbringing throughout her life. Marie claimed to never have missed a day of Mass. Marie was said to have been tall and beautiful, with curly black hair and skin that was more golden than African, and delicate, angelic-like features. Afforded what was considered a luxury of the time, Marie was both well-educated and professionally schooled as a hairdresser. It was this choice of career that would propel a young Marie forward and aid her in rubbing elbows with the elite of New Orleans. At the age of 25, Marie married a young free man of color from Haiti named Jacques Santiago Paris. Paris was among a large group of immigrators fleeing Haiti from the revolution of 1804. It is due to this that the resurgence in voodoo popularity grew among those with African and Creole heritage in the city. The couple's marriage license is preserved and maintained at the St. Louis Cathedral in New Orleans and is viewable to patrons visiting. Moving to an area known as the French Quarter, it has been substantiated that the couple had two daughters, both named Marie, as was Catholic tradition. Paris's demise is a little sketchy, with some sources claiming his death in 1820 and others listing him disappearing or abandoning the family, never to return. Either way, the young woman declared herself a widow and even owned the alias, the Widow Paris. It was during this time that she returned to her roots and began servicing the elite of the city by keeping their locks looking coiffed. Marie now held a position that afforded her a vast amount of information about her wealthy clientele, provided by none other than the African slaves who felt a kinship to Marie due to her color and also because of their scorn for their owners. What is lesser known of Marie's endeavors is that during these years, she became actively involved as a nurse. Although she had no formal training in the field, she would donate her time to caring for prisoners on death row, even assisting in surgeries and also inviting the sick and desolate into her home to nurse them back to health. As Marie gathered information in secret about affairs and crimes, 
Her business grew to the point where she was able to open up her own boutique. And it was during these intimate sessions with clients that she gained their trust and admiration, as well as a reputation for having magical and even supernatural abilities. Marie soon found herself involved with a man named Jean-Louis Christophe Dumini de Glapion, and together birthed anywhere from 7 to 15 children. Reports vary. Sadly, a few of the children were victims of yellow fever that had swept through the area during that time due to the city's atrocious drainage system. Although the couple never wed, they lived in a common-law marriage until his death in 1855. Drawing on her mother's African roots, Laveau felt drawn to the voodoo religion. Although she never deterred from her Catholic upbringing, she instead drew on the Haitian voodoo training she received from witch doctor Dr. John, also known as John Bayo, and soon dominated over the many other local voodoo practitioners. People would travel from all over to seek the counsel of the esteemed queen on issues ranging from business and finances to childbearing and healing. Marie would in turn provide the sufferer with magic potion, a religious ritual, and sometimes a charm to instill a curse or hex. Conducting her religious rituals among three locations in a city, at her home on St. Anne Street, Congo Square, and on the shores of Bayou St. John on Lake Pontchartrain, she combined elements of Haitian voodoo, Catholicism, and other forms of Christianity to form a unique assemblance of spiritual interpretation. Complete with candles, snakes, and ritualistic dancing, Laveau and her many followers and clients were a regular sight in New Orleans. Worshipped by many for her mystical power, her humanitarian effort should not go unnoticed. Many in the area still view her as a saint for all the healing she provided to the poor of the city. Marie's reign as the voodoo queen of New Orleans reportedly was only challenged one time. In 1850, a Creole woman named Rosalie set out to instill fear in the community and put an end to Laveau's reign. She even placed a life-size wooden cross, complete with ritualistic carvings and beads reportedly imported from Africa, in her front yard. The woman soon garnered attention from townsfolk, expressing their worry and demanding that something be done. Laveau wasted no time removing the cross from the woman's yard, and even propped the statuesque symbol up inside her home as a way of mocking the woman's power. Court papers were filed, and Marie found herself in hot water with the council of the city, but ultimately the case was thrown out, leaving Laveau the undefeated high priestess. In or around 1875, Marie reportedly hung up her channeling ability and went into retirement, living a quiet life in her beloved St. Anne Street home, referred to as one of the kindest women who ever lived by writer Lafcadio Hearn. She met a peaceful end at age 86 in 1881. Her obituary was featured in both the New Orleans Times Picayune and the New York Times. And while reports of her ghost still linger amid the city, her main haunt seems to be that of her eternal resting place. Thousands make the pilgrimage each year to pay their respects to the voodoo queen, and her face is still a muse for local artists, and her legend a favorite among famous musicians. Due to vandalism and theft, her tomb is now only viewable through local ghost tours, and don't even think about leaving an infamous X on her grave, which is now a punishable offense. Just express your respect, gaze in awe, and leave this often misconstrued saint to rest in peace. This story, this story all around. I love this story. Uh, what, you don't like it? Just everything about it. I think you whine a lot. Yeah, it's got a bunch of my, my creeped, my creeped out things that I don't like. What, voodoo and... Louisiana swamps, oh alligators, God. and voodoo. And voodoo. All three things I don't care for. What I think about this story, it, well, that is cool, that is really cool. Is, are we jumping into it or are you just... Well, no, I'm just, well, kind of, yeah. Oh, okay, go ahead. Uh, 
Why are you always trying to shush me? I'm not. I'm just making sure. Are we officially starting or are you just kind of small talking? I'm always a small talking. Oh, I know. But I didn't know that she was such a, that, that she did so much humanitarian work. I, I, I don't think a lot of people, well, I mean, you know, unless you're from that area, from Louisiana, did you know? That she did the humanitarian work? Yeah. Well, I guess no, but. So I think that's really, really cool because like initially when you think of Marie LeBeau, it is like you said, you know, witchcraft or I mean, not witchcraft, voodoo Mm -hmm. and, you know, creepiness and all that. Mm -hmm. And I mean, yeah, she there there is that aspect that, you know, yes, she did practice voodoo, but that she did so much good and, and really helped people. Yeah. So I was really impressed by that. I didn't know that. Well, let's let's actually jump into it now. Okay. I had a few things I wanted to go over kind of first. Okay. Well, of course you did. Uh, well, I'm just saying. So the first thing is um, the whole story kind of revolves around voodoo in the area that is Louisiana, specifically to a lot of these things, New Orleans. So I wanted to kind of start to cover some of the terminology that the rest of the country may not be aware of when we're talking about Marie LeBeau voodoo in Louisiana. So the first one uh, would be uh, the term Creole. There's two terms that come from Louisiana, especially southern Louisiana, that if you're not from there, can sometimes get confused. And those two terms are Creole and Cajun. Yeah. Okay. So the I wanted to... Differentiate the two. I wanted to differentiate the two and kind of give a brief explanation of both. Um Let's start with Creole, because technically we didn't say the word Cajun here, but sometimes they do get interchanged, yeah. and they should not be. Uh, do you know much about the origins of, of the word Creole or the Creole people? I, I, isn't Creole French? Okay, so... No. Maybe I'm wrong. I'm probably wrong. I don't okay, know. so let's start, let's start with the other side. Okay, that I, I, I probably misspoke. Let's start with the other side. Let's start with Cajun, okay? C- the word Cajun... And the people of Cajun descent, okay, stemmed from French Canada, okay, oh, okay. mainly around the area of like uh, Nova Scotia, uh, New Brunswick, okay. We have a lot of French settlers that came in there in the 1600s, okay. They come over from France, and the that area was budded decently close to uh, the British colonies at the time that kind of extended up north into Canada. At some point, um, Britain became and, and uh, came into ownership of that area and attempted to uh, make them abide by British rules. Now, hopefully, I, hopefully I'm not mistaken this. I'm hopefully, because I don't have anything up. I'm just going off of memory. So I'm going to talk out of my butt possibly. So uh, to establish colonial rule among these French descendants, and you have to remember too that at this point in time, the, the British people of England and the UK uh, were heavily Anglican. Um, I don't actually 1600s. They may still have been Catholic. Okay. Bear with me. Regardless, they were not treated well. Okay. So they kind of shifted them out of that area. Um, for numerous reasons, some of them just left kind of hopping colony to colony, um, on their way down the Atlantic seaboard. So they would eventually come to rest or find a, uh, find a, a haven for acceptance in Louisiana and New Orleans. And the reason why is because we do have this conflagration, this storm of different ethnicities coming into play in Louisiana. You have the uh, the French, which actually held that, that territory for the longest time. If you remember your middle school history of the Louisiana Purchase and how far that territory extended, this was the focal point, um, especially being in the Gulf of Mexico, trade points, easily accessible through the Mississippi River. Uh, the French did hold a lot of sway, especially since they owned the territory, obviously. So these Cajuns of being of, of French and Catholic descent found found a home here, okay? Um, they're kind of known as like the hillbilly version of the people who live in Louisiana. Oh, okay? that's not nice. I had actually read, and this was a, and this, I, I'm not going to quote it exactly, but it was a comment on a site here. Do I still have it up? Oh, I still have it up. Um, it was the it's it's the experienceneworleans.com site. And it kind of it kind of walks you through the history of Cajuns and Creoles, okay? So, someone had commented on there and I think it it gives a good 
kind of indication of how that term is used and how it was viewed up until recently. The comment says, I recall in the 70s and well into the 80s that a person a person from Baton Rouge or New Orleans, a Cajun, did not go over well. Only when Cajun food via Paul Brudholm and his Popeye's... Prudhomme, sorry, Paul Prudhomme and his Popeye's chicken became all the rage. Did this change? Many would now admit, uh, m- many would not admit this now, but it has a, uh, ooh, I can't even read today, but it is how it was mostly prior to the mid 80s or so. A Cajun, as viewed by the superior breed of those in Baton Rouge and New Orleans, was a backward swamp kind of person who was viewed to be illiterate. Oh, wow. So, the food industry kind of changed the view of, of how Cajuns, well, how Cajuns are viewed. So essentially, it would be Louisiana's form of redneck or hillbilly. I can relate to that. Um, being from West Virginia. They have a special dialect being, if you're of Cajun descent, you tend to have a special dialect. And some people have made the connection that this dialect sounds vaguely Brooklyn-ish, which in theory, kind of makes sense if the Cajuns from French Canada, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick area, New Brunswick area, came south to hit New York before they made their way down past Florida yeah. and Louisiana. I personally don't think it sounds very. I don't Brooklyn-ish, either. But the stereotype of a Cajun would be a person you can't understand. Like oh, yeah, you can't it understand. It is kind of hard to because I've been down there n- numerous times, and it is kind of hard to under you know understand them. Yeah, um, if you are not from that area. If you are not from the United States, um, I imagine the country that you currently live in have different dialects. And every country seems to have a dialect that is kind of considered, I don't know, beneath the majority. And in the United States, those are usually considered rednecks or hillbillies. And you get progressively worse in some states compared to others. We spoke on our last episode how you're from West Virginia. Yep. And a lot of the other states would view West Virginia as being backwoods. Yeah. And we kind of spoke to that in the episode, uh, especially being a lot of Scottish descendants. A lot um, of Italians. That is a whole separate story I will not get into, but originally Scottish because it because oh. the mountains of Appalachia kind of made them feel like it was highland scotland and of course in scotland the highland area is kind of their redneck and the lowland area being near the the ports and the water tended to have more of the traders from other places come in so you have more of an exchange of ideas happening at the ports thus making the port areas kind of more hoity-toity yeah uh, more progressive as opposed to the kind of hard to reach highland villages which tended to stay traditional and a little more, well, redneckish. So they they found those areas to be reminiscent of home in West Virginia, for example. So uh, this is carried further, for example, again, in Louisiana. So I wanted to differentiate that Cajun idea. And nowadays, it's not, I don't think it's as bad of like a derogatory term being Cajun. In fact, there's a, I think there's a smaller college in Louisiana called the Raging Cajuns. Oh. That's their mascot. Yeah. Um, so... Let's move on to Creole. Now, Creole is kind of a generic term. Like I, like we said before, the area that is Louisiana, the Mississippi Delta, in around around that same area, has had a mixture of Spanish, French, um, as well as West African cultures. Obviously, in the slave trade with the slave coast of Western Africa, a lot of people were stolen from their homes and brought over as slaves. A lot of them came to the Caribbean, the southern United States on the Atlantic seaboard, as well as the United States and the Gulf of Mexico. So what's really important here is with that mixture of these different backgrounds, Spanish, French, Western African, you have a literal mixing pot of beliefs and cultures. Yeah. And it's become solely, solely, um, what's the word? Distinctive in the area. So the word Creole can be used to describe any mixture of Spanish, French, and West African mixing of, of, in, in that, in that area. Okay. So when we say Marie Laveau was of Creole descent, she, uh, I don't think, was she, was she born in West Africa? I can't remember what we had said, but now I'm throwing out so many historical facts I forget. Uh, no, I think she was born in Louisiana. So she was probably... But her, uh, it says her mother was uh, of Native American, African, 
yeah, and Marie Laveau herself was a freed woman. So yeah. she was of, of multiple descents in the area, which would fall under the umbrella term of Creole. Yeah. So uh, I know that's a lot of information right off the bat, but it's kind of important to bring up these terms because these terms really define the area. If you ever go to Louisiana, heck, if you go to southern Mississippi even, I haven't been to that side of Texas, but I have been to both southern Mississippi and Louisiana and New Orleans. You see these reoccurring names. You see yeah. the definite saturation of french culture oh yeah yeah definitely into, into louisiana and into new orleans heck if you're into american football new orleans saints um that mixture of catholicism as well in with this this french background we have uh, oh, oh i should say along with the you know the indigenous uh religions of africa you see it everywhere you see this mixture of, of the french language you see this mixture of catholicism as well as with the West African traditions that we will see today in in voodoo. Well, and I think too, with you know, it, it's important to differentiate between the two to kind of get a feel for that time period and how uh, Marie Laveau might have been viewed, you know, because she was of you know Creole. Yeah, yeah. So I wanted to first explain those terms. So hopefully, uh, if you are still awake after that explanation, I know I started nodding <laughs> off there, and I'm like, wow. Uh, some some of these things are historically important to yeah, me, and yeah. I think it's it's important to convey those things. So let's get into voodoo, okay? Voodoo creeps me out. Now there are many different types of voodoo, okay? We have a very specific form of voodoo in New Orleans, and it's called. Can you guess? Voodoo. No. I don't know. New Orleans voodoo. That would be Come it. on. That was my second I guess. I gave it to you. New Orleans wow. voodoo. Now, I have heard, okay, and this is getting kind of confusing too and nitpicky if you're not in there, but it's important to know too. The term hoodoo, as you just used. Yeah. Okay. There is a specific form of voodoo called hoodoo in South Carolina in the Gullah area. Now, again, it's the slight changes of how both Catholicism from the Spanish and the French mixed with the West African indigenous practices and how they mixed uh, that made the different kinds of Caribbean voodoo with like, for example, New Orleans voodoo or hoodoo from S South Carolina. Now, as a caveat, I have heard that the word hoodoo is still involved in New Orleans voodoo, but it's more of the belief in some type of charm. Yeah. Like you believe in the hoodoo of this charm that's inside of voodoo. Does that yeah, make sense? Yeah. Did I, did I say it clearly enough? Yeah. Okay. But I can't I can't be certain of that. So I, I believe I heard that at some point in time. So when we get into voodoo and what Marie Laveau is kind of known for being the, the voodoo queen of, of New Orleans, we have we have this mixing. Again, we see this mixing over and over again, especially in this area of various different cultures of various different sources. And we have something that's uniquely Louisiana, something that's uniquely New Orleans. Uh, and so voodoo, uh, you you have the the worship, the the praise of saints. And as we said with Marie Laveau, never has, has being said of never missing a day of mass, but also holding the different deities of West Africa at the same time. And for them, there was no mutual exclusion. OK, you could you could do both because there were equatable things. Yeah. Um, I wish I had saved that page. But one deity from West Africa was compared, for example, to uh, an archangel or something. So when you, you, when you ask for help from an archangel, in theory to them, you're asking from the same equatable Western African deity as well. I see. It's the same. Yeah. So they have these all over. So when, you, when you're worshiping uh, whoever you choose to worship or ask for, for, for help, okay, let me back up a little bit. If you're not familiar with Catholicism, um, you have different saints. You have patron saints of a lot of stuff. Okay. Yeah. Now, I'm not Catholic, so please pardon me if I get this wrong, but I believe, for example, St. Christopher uh, is the patron saint of safe travels, I believe. Okay. Now, are you worshiping St. Christopher? No, you're not. But if you have like a dream team of people to help you, which is God and these patron saints. Some of them may have certain abilities that are kind of like their forte. Like he's really good at this. And if I have this right, I hope I do because I'm going to put my foot in my mouth. But for example, St. Christopher, patron saint of safe travels. If you plan on taking a long trip, then you might wear your St. Christopher's medal to help ensure a safe trip. Okay. Now this kind of 
almost, and I don't mean to offend anybody when I say this, but it's kind of a specific kind of polytheism. Okay. Now, the reason why that may be that may be problematic for some people is that Christianity, Catholicism, Catholicism being a branch of Christianity, is considered a monotheism. Yeah. There is one God. One God. Okay. But in reality, if you're asking for help from multiple deity-like things, then one could possibly argue that it is a polytheistic religion. Now, the way that kind of Christianity and Catholicism specifically gets around this is that God gives power to everybody. It's God's ultimate power that he's giving. So whoever he's giving it to, it's still his power. Therefore, he's the one. Yeah, just like asking if you ask uh, Archangel Michael or Archangel Gabriel for help. Mm -hmm. It's you're asking for a branch of God. Yep. Uh, like an administrative team there you under go. God. Yep. As opposed to being separate gods yeah. and having their own their own separate thing that they're a god of, which would be altogether polytheistic. Um, voodoo really incorporates the idea together. And so when you when you ask for, for help from a certain saint or a certain West African god, they're the same sometimes in voodoo. Mm-hmm. So we start to get into um, I guess a lot of the stereotypes that you may see or know already of voodoo, like the voodoo dolls and stuff like that. Um, but there's a lot of give and take, a lot of sacrifice with with if you need to get something done, here's what you need to do. And usually there's some type of sacrifice in order to do it, which is very reminiscent of, of you know, the sacrifice of the lamb and everything else. Yeah. So there's a very close melting point with both of these things. Now, I do know that uh, two of her two of her daughters uh, again, both named Marie, and I can't remember what their middle names are, but I believe it is the oldest one. Uh, kind of assumed uh, her mother's position as far as being the voodoo queen of New Orleans. Yeah, and I should have had her name. It's obviously it's Marie, but I can't. Yeah. I want to say it's Augustine or something like that. Okay, I do believe. Yeah. Um. So yeah, she still continues her mother's legacy and. Kind of really, I, it, it, the way they describe it is it, it's almost as if she kind of adopted um, her, mother, her, her mother's life. Yeah. So. And so let's, let's get into what does it mean to be the voodoo queen of New Orleans? Um, do you have any direct thoughts before I begin another tangent? No, go ahead. I'll, okay. I got my pillow and blanket. Go ahead. There you go. I'm okay. ready to go. So what does it mean to be a voodoo queen or a voodoo king? Because we also mentioned uh, John Bayou in the narrative as well. Very well known. Who was the teacher of Marie Laveau, it is said. Uh, what does it mean to be a voodoo queen or a voodoo king? It means that you are held in high respect and high regards as to being able to teach how to reduce afflictions. Heal, to gain a help. Healer. Yep. Uh, it is essentially what the priesthood is in most other religions. It's just there's a lot more interpretation. There's a lot more um, little things that you can do as opposed to just saying your Hail Marys and, and counting your rosary beads. There are a lot of little things you know, pulling from that West African tradition that you can do. And that's that's where you tend to get into, like I said, again, the stereotype of the voodoo doll or something like that. Now, you don't necessarily always have to be negative because you have to pay attention to the negative that you put out. There's about, ba- yeah, there's always a balance. Mm-hmm, because whatever bad you put out, then then that bad needs to be, ta- that bad needs to be taken, mm-hmm. you know, so that could come back around on you. Yeah. So you got to make sure of how that's working. So a voodoo priestess or a voodoo, a voodoo priest would help facilitate the proper way that you need to execute that. It really kind of reminds me almost of um, being a Native American uh, medicine man or a shaman or, uh, you know, kind of comparable to something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So... Even if you're not fully familiar with what exactly they do, um, you're familiar with other religions or practices that do have the same the same thing. They're spiritual leaders, um, spiritual guiders, and that's what they do. And and with being the voodoo queen of New Orleans, Marie Laveau would have been the top echelon, the most knowledgeable, yeah. the most respected, and the most effective. Uh, powerful. Uh, and what uh, what she did, and so you would tend to have her help if you could gain counsel with her. Yeah. Um, if, if not, then you might be relegated to someone who's less than the voodoo queen. 
So a lot of the story uh, conjures up for me, and I kind of stated it before, a lot of fear because I just, I get creeped out. Yeah, there's a, uh, it's pretty high on the creep meter Yeah, Louisiana bothers me. I've been to Louisiana, like I said, I've been to Louisiana once. We went and vacationed in southern Mississippi, Biloxi Beach, uh, Gulf Breeze area. Um, and we went over to New Orleans. And I'd always said that I never wanted to go to New Orleans. New Orleans uh, you can have, is very cool. You can have it. I don't ever want to go. Yeah, it's and very so cool. And so I was talked into going, and I said, you know what? If I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it the best of my ability with the short time I have here. So we went from uh, Biloxi Beach, Mississippi, over to New Orleans, Louisiana. And you get there, and... There's a distinct air I, I didn't in Louisiana, even, of, of, um, like a vibe. I didn't even want to go there. There, there is, there is. I mean, I didn't want to go with the vibe description because a lot of people say that about a lot of different things. And when we first got there, yes, there was a vibe, but at the same time, the region has a vibe. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, what, okay. This is what I first noticed about Louisiana. When you first go to Louisiana as a tourist, you go to the French quarter. That's what you do, okay? Um, whatever you plan on doing in the French Quarter is to your own, whether or not you want to go for, like, tours or you want to go to drink on Bourbon Street, which, by the way, if you're not a drinker, don't even don't even go. Yo, Just don't go to Bourbon eat, Street. You know. We literally came off of, uh, and I can't remember street names right now, we came off one one street to walk on Bourbon Street for a block to turn left to go get beignets because we oh, had heard yeah. about beignets. Oh. So we, we we weren't on Bourbon Street for a block to get back off to get these beignets before we were like literally accosted at every turn yeah. by people trying to literally grab you and pull you into a bar. Oh my god. That's what they will do. Like they will like grab take you by your arm and try to walk you into these bars and that's totally not me. I'm not a public drinker, not really. I like to drink by myself. Leave me alone. I'm going to drink beers. And and be just just lonely, I guess. I don't know, but the exact opposite of what <laughs> Bourbon Street is. I don't want to have fun when so I we, drink. Leave me alone. Yeah, so we immediately got off because there were people like doing the white girl dances. Woo! Oh yeah. Woo! And of course, the Saints were playing that night. Oh God! And so they had just just buses full of just, just drunken buses, white buses ladies. Full of woo! <laughs> oh, and I'll tell you what, it just instantly taps nerve in me as a drunken white lady. Just oh. Woo! I know I'm gonna keep doing it, and there's a special dance that none of you will be able to see. That every white lady who gets I drunk see enough, the dance. I want to see I the even, dance. It's like I gotta see it. It's like, is that really a? Oh, there it is. There it is. That's what it is, right? <laughs> every drunk white lady does this at some point when they're still half able to walk, right? I'm and gonna just, get this on video and post it in, on the page. Oh my god. You, so, will, you will immediately recognize it when you see it. So you be like, oh, yeah, yeah. So that wasn't that wasn't for me. Bourbon Street wasn't for me. But what what was for me was uh, as many of the tours I could get on. And, and unfortunately, what does suck is we weren't there long enough to be on to get oh. on a tour. To add to that, a lot of the cemeteries there are kind of magnets for people. Okay, there's very specific way they set up their cemeteries that you really don't see anywhere else in the United States. No, well, it's because the 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 hurricanes and the flooding and all of that. They have a lot of abund- above ground tombs, yeah. uh, mausoleums mm-hmm. and stuff like that. And now Crips. they have them like boarded up, so you can't even get into a lot no. of them. And unfortunately, the way you can get into them is by paying money to a ghost tour. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, th- I, you know what? I think we said that in the yeah. And the monologue there. Uh, so when we were there, none of them were open. We could not catch any tours. So in order to get what little pictures we could, um, I can't remember which one we had went to. Uh, we had to like, um, my brother-in-law is like 6'5". So he had to like take a phone and jump and snap pictures while jumping over the top <laughs> of these of these walls. Uh, so all these crypts and tombs and mausoleums, especially what, like kind of what we said with Marie Laveau's, we couldn't even see up close. We had to get... Yeah. You know, that far back to see and jump over walls and stuff. But if you uh, happen to go to a lot of these, they will have markers on them and and marks and markings and stuff all over them. And it's kind of this tradition, this voodoo tradition. To add on top of that, I wanted to really kind of mix this story because I'm not sure if we're going to do a whole lot of true crime. There are a lot of podcasts that do true crime stuff, and it's a big thing right now. Well, I shouldn't even say right now. Technically, it's been big for like ever, right? True crime. It's kind of a 
a human thing. They want to know about crimes other people have committed and they kind of live vicariously through those stories as horrible as they may be. But New Orleans has a very special one that is kind of tied to voodoo. Okay, have you ever heard of Zach and Addy? Uh, yeah, I believe so. Um, where he killed his girlfriend. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is a pretty terrible story, but I wanted to bring it in because there's an air of voodoo to it. If you would, if you would be interested in this story, um, an author by the name of Ethan Brown wrote a book called Shake the Devil Off. It's called, well, Shake the Devil Off, a true story of the murder that rocked New Orleans. And it's about um, Zachary Bowen and... Addie Hall, I think. Was Addie her Hall. Name. Yes, thank you. Addie Hall. That's so weird because I actually just, um, I was going through Pinterest last night just scrolling and I found that story. So that's yeah. weird that you would bring that up. Zach was originally, I believe, from the Pacific Northwest and he ended up moving a couple of different places and ended up serving in, in Iraq before Hurricane Katrina came across the, the Gulf of Mexico. And he was in, he ended up. Uh, settling in Louisiana in the French Quarter um, off of Rampart Street. And if you ever go to Louisiana, the French Quarter, I believe Rampart Street is like the start of the French Quarter. Um, I'm not a French Quarter or a New Orleans expert here, but when you come in, Rampart Street is like a like a four lane divided road. And it has like a um, like a grassy area with trees in the middle of it, if I yeah. remember it right. And their house was right off of Rampart Street. Their apartment was. And the story goes that, um, and I don't want to give too much away for the book because there's also, I wish I could, I could have found it. There's a YouTube video on it because I think it was a part of the history channel. There's a history channel show that featured it, but essentially Zach killed Addie. Well, I think their apartment, uh, was above, located above a voodoo store. You always jump ahead on me. Well, I just wanted to say that. You always jump ahead on me. So Zach kills Addie, unfortunately, and it was pretty brutal. Yeah. I don't want to get into the very specifics of it. And if you look it up, please do. It's it's fascinating, albeit a bit gruesome. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He ends up uh, committing suicide by jumping off of a casino parking garage, I believe. Yeah. And there's a note in his pocket. So it led to police to the, to the scene. And again, what they find is pretty bad. So I'm going to not push... Anything other than this book and any YouTube documentaries you can see, because I, I don't want to go any, any further into that. Again, I don't want to foray into any true crime just yet, because other people have done this story, and they do it much better than we than we can at this yeah. time. So please look that up. Um, but the main point I want to get at for this episode was that there could be, uh, and one of these documentaries kind of, kind of talk about this, during Katrina, a lot of people did leave. Okay, a lot of people had to stay. But a lot of people did leave. And the voodoo culture, especially the underground voodoo culture of New Orleans, you can have shrines everywhere to whatever you're praying to, to whatever you're asking service of. And all at once for Katrina, everyone left. So now you have all these shrines sitting, not being tended to. So from a spiritual aspect, from a voodoo aspect, you now have all of these entities now not controlled, now not being sacrificed to, not being paid attention to, so you could have a spiritual muck running yeah. <laughs> of, of these deities and entities and everything else. Now, again, if you believe in this kind of thing, and even if you don't directly believe in voodoo, you may view voodoo as kind of a demon summoning device. <laughs> yeah. You know, a lot of people, a lot of people they would think, kind of view it, the, yeah. view it as that. And even if you're going to view it respectfully, that's kind of spiritually how it could work. Okay. You, you have, you have a person, a deity, a thing that you are asking service of. So you may summon it or conjure it via one of these shrines and you have to do certain things to make sure you keep it in line with what you want it to do. Because if not, it could go off and do its own thing. So now you have this big storm coming. And at first, no one really thought it was going to be that bad, right? We have the yeah. levees. That's what the levees do. They hold the, they hold the ocean back. We're good. And Katrina was not that. Uh, many, many people died in Katrina. Many, many people were stranded during Katrina. So you had these people who, who are now gone, not tending these religious idols. So some people say that, yes, their apartment was above something of the sort, some type of if not outright voodoo store, I can't remember exactly, but there was some type of maybe worship going on there. And one of these entities, how can you say it? Took Ran over Zach. And, yeah. Took over Zach. 
and possessed him to do such horrible things to Addy and subsequently to Addy's body. Mm -hmm. So this idea of voodoo and leading back into Marie Laveau is deeply seated in New Orleans and you could you could feel it. Oh, yeah. Anywhere you go. Mm -hmm. Okay. There is kind of this laissez-faire because I'm and you know how I feel about French, like a laissez-faire attitude when you go, especially to the French Quarter, and you could feel the the palpable vibe. Yeah. And I don't. I've only said that about one other place I've ever visited, and it's the place that I would love to move to, and that's Salem, Massachusetts. Yeah. Um. So, the story of Zach and Addie, into to me, plays a part in how one can view the city of New Orleans and possibly other parts of Louisiana yeah, and that you have the dichotomy of how logically things happen and then how sometimes spirituality, whether positive or negative could play a role, but also could not play a role. And to me, that's what voodoo is, is the uncertainty of what is happening around you and how can I fix it? And if I fix it, what's it going to cost? Yeah. So I just wanted to add that story in. It's one of the things I was thinking about when doing research about Marie Laveau is Zach and Addie kind of came to mind because it's a story that hit home with me when I first heard it. And that when I was in Louisiana, I wanted to see where they were. And I got to see at the time, I thought I got to see the the apartment. Yeah. Uh, after researching it more, which I should have done, I think their apartment burned down. The original apartment that they were in burned down, but they re- rebuilt another building in its exact spot. And now it's like a ghost tours office. Oh, it uh, whatever. I also believe it was featured on a Ghost Adventures episode where they actually went up. And I think this was before it burned down. They went up and did an investigation in mm-hmm. the apartment. I could be wrong about that one, too. So you have to do homework if you're interested in that. Do you have anything to wrap this back around for Marie Laveau? <laughs> I don't think so. No, no. OK, I uh, you kind of popped in and ruined it with your. With what? Zach and Addie's story. Oh, like I said, those, those no, are... No, I, I know, yeah. To me, those are those are tied together because of... I think so, too. Of of the, the voodoo culture and the voodoo lore that yeah, kind like, of permeates. You know, like, oh, you know, with being in Ohio, you know, it. I think any being anywhere other than in Louisiana, if you say voodoo, you know, people get creeped out. Yeah. And like you said, it instantly conjures bad... It's not good. It's not good. You know, but, but it a lot of it really isn't. I mean, you know, the bad that we think it is, um, not to say some of it, you know, is sure. Um, but you know, in that area in Louisiana, like they take this very serious. Yeah. I mean, it would be as if you went to, um, Utah and started bashing Mormons. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It'd really be the same. They take it very seriously. And there's most definitely, you can tell, well, I mean, I could tell, like, uh, you know, almost immediately, as soon as you step into Louisiana, that feeling is there. And I have like this love hate with with the area. I love Louisiana. I, they have the best food I have ever tasted in my entire life I have had in Louisiana. Nicest people, but I've had paranormal exper- an, a, a paranormal experience there that just, I don't know if I would ever go back. So again, it's that love, hate. I love it as long as I don't have to go there. I'll tell you right now, and I'm going to do a shameless plug because um, I'm going to set this precedence right now. I like chicken. I don't love chicken. Okay. Yeah, that's Not, me. I, I like it. Like I, I, okay, I do love rotisserie chicken. Okay. Oh, besides, yeah. Besides rotisserie chicken, and you're looking at me like that, like you're agreeing. Yeah, right? I do agree. Besides rotisserie chicken, I like chicken, but I don't love chicken. So when we first went to Louisiana, we went to one of those. Well, I think we asked directions for something, and it was one of these, um, services that kind of like direct you. There's oh. a word for it, and I'm I'm being dumb today. Uh, let's move on from that. Uh, and they directed us to uh, like, what are some places to eat? You know, I want to try what New Orleans is. Yeah. Food, because that's me. I love food. Oh, me so too. So whenever I go to a new town or a new state, I want to know what they eat. I yeah. don't want to get McDonald's and I don't want to whatever. And maybe that's like splurging on a vacation, but that's what vacation is to me in part. Yeah, me too. I want, if I'm going to New England, I'm going to get some clam chowder. Uh, I'm going to get roll or a, a lobster, lobster roll. roll. Yep. I'm gonna, but I don't want one that's made mass market made. I yeah. want to know like if, if this is what you people dig. Where can I get? Where do the locals go for where can I get authentic yours? food from yeah. that area? So the the person at the place that was giving us directions recommended Coop's Place. 
in the French Quarter. And they said, he says, you'll have the best fried chicken you've ever had. And I, and I, I think I literally go, okay. Because I'm not a fan of chicken. Yeah, me neither. Like, that's like saying, like, you'll have the best Kool-Aid you've ever had. Yeah. Like, okay. <laughs> like, that's fantastic. Thanks. So I even told Tara when we were there, I'm like, do you want to, do you want to go to Coop's place? And she goes, you're the one that's not a huge fan of chicken. Do you want to go? I'm like, well, this guy set the precedence that it's got the best fried chicken you've ever had. So let's go to Coop's place. If you ever go to Coop's place, first thing you need to know is it is a bar and they do not allow children in. Oh. It is a restaurant. But you, you have to be of bar age to get in. So if you have kids that are there, try to get taken out, I think, across across the street. Um, and they have very tiny streets in the French Quarter. Uh, across the street is someplace I think you can sit down. So if you have kids, make sure you know that before you go. But I am not joking when I say it is the best fried chicken you've ever had. Really? I swear to you. Huh. And this is and I just established that I don't, I'm not a big fan of chicken. I'm telling you of Every place I've ever had fried chicken, and maybe it's maybe it's just because if I don't like chicken, like I don't have a lot of it, so if it's good, I'm still not getting it usually. Yeah. But this place called Coops makes the best fried chicken you've ever had. Oh God, now I want to try it. It's fantastic. We had a whole meal, and uh, they have one that's like um, like a New Orleans sampler. So you got a little bit of red beans and rice. You got a little bit Ooh. of gumbo, a little bit of this of uh, a little bit of this um fried chicken that's so great and i paired it with uh the big easy ipa and it was fantastic oh so if you're ever down at coop's place grab a big easy ipa grab one of these new orleans samplers and then I, i'm not lying to you it'll be the best fried chicken i you've can't ever had. remember where we ate at um i can't even remember the name of it but it was like this big barn type thing building and like it didn't look fancy like i think they had like picnic tables inside you know with a red and white yeah. Uh, tablecloth yeah so nothing fancy you know i wasn't expecting i was just dying of hunger so we get in here and i i love i'm a seafood fanatic i yeah. love shrimp Me crab too. lobster anything like that Me fish too. love it and i had ordered the etouffee, etouffee platter or something like that oh my god good. oh my god was it good oh my god like it had the etouffee sauce with the 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 crawfish in it and then it had like this tower of just seafood amazement it was it was oh my god like it had deep fried shrimp and i don't even remember but it was like on this huge skewer sat in the middle of this etouffee and rice yeah oh i when i think about it now my mouth waters yeah, yeah. like it was that good yeah you know 17 years ago and i can still remember how good it was yeah so, so yes. going going over there and kind of adding on to the story, and we're way off topic right now, but I'm fully committed to this at this point. Uh, on the trip over from Biloxi to New Orleans, um, I kind of had a buck list of things. Oops, I, hit, I hit my desk. I had a buck list of things I wanted to try that, uh, in my mind, is 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 New Orleans, what New Orleans is, right? So that little platter covered most of it except for one thing, and that one thing is called Nutria. Have you ever heard of Nutria? Uh uh-uh. uh This is a great. This is a great thing. Nutria is a very large rodent. It looks Stop. as if... I don't like where this is going. It looks like as if you had a guinea pig that you let grow and its legs extended more than a normal guinea pig's would. That's so creepy. It's, I don't know, maybe a foot and a half tall. Where do you find these? Okay, so there's a backstory to this. Oh, uh, God. I believe Nutria were native to Venezuela. And at the time of... The, the French colonization shortly after, maybe it might have been mid-1800, so after after the purchase, well, yeah, 17, 18, after the, the, the Napoleonic purchase of the French territory that is in the United States, there's a big thing for beaver hides. That's what a lot of some, well, uh, some of Canada, some of the United States, that's what the, the trappers did was they got beaver hides and you would make them into hats and clothing and stuff, very, very popular. After you kill so many beaver, though, like you yeah. run out of beaver, right? More beavers. So what they did, and I think this is again this whole this whole episode, I'm just talking right out of my ass. Um, so I could be wrong, but they brought nutria over because they were very plentiful. They can reproduce very quickly, and their their fur is essentially very close to beaver fur. So they let them loose. Unfortunately, what they didn't take into consideration, which is what people tend to do, uh, not take not take things into consideration, the nutria will feed on the roots of tall grasses. So if you ever go to Louisiana and you're in the bayou, besides the big trees that kind of house the more indoor sections of it, the outer sections near the ocean 
are these tall grasses that kind of grow on these sandbars or, you know, whatever, whatever. These nutria began eating all the grass roots that are on these naturally occurring sandbars and everything else. And now what you have are naked areas of land. And now the, the, the ocean will wear it away. All the water wears it away because the grass was essentially holding it all there. Yeah. So now they have a big problem in that the nutria is kind of destroying things. So there's been a big push. Um, I, if I had to take a guess, maybe in the past 20 or 30 years of getting people to eat nutria. Okay. You can go out and kill things if you want to and just kill it just to kill it because it needs killed, quote unquote. But if you have a reason to kill it, such as hmm, to eat I, it, I can eat it, then it's then it's easier to get people to kill them. So there's been a lot of recipes put out for eating nutria. I'm not going to eat that. And you have to look them up. They have huge yellow teeth. I'm not going to eat that. <laughs> uh, I'll have to get uh, some links to put for you to post about nutria. I don't even care nutria. if you put gravy on it. I'm not. And I, I don't think even they care do. if you put, put etouffee on it. I'm not eating it. Well, do you ever eat squirrel? No. No. A squirrel's pretty good. I had. I, I did when I was little. Yeah. I had someone bring in squirrel to work one time. I had at at an old job, someone brought in squirrel and it was like dark meat chicken, squirrel wings. Yeah. That's what it it was in a gravy. Mm -hmm. Super good. So I wanted to try this Nutria, which tends to be from what I understand, more stringy. I knew you were going to say that. that But I couldn't find a restaurant within the time frame that I had to look it up that had Nutria. So if anybody out there knows anywhere that I can get Nutria in New Orleans, next time I go, please Send me send send me a message. Well, I'm not going to eat it because I want to try Nutria. So, and and like I said, I was committed to that story, but we are way off topic with Marie Laveau. So, uh, some common some common thoughts. Do you have any thoughts about Marie Laveau other than what we've said? Um, no, just that like I had said, uh, even I didn't before research, doing the research for this podcast. Yeah, I didn't know about I you know Marie Laveau voodoo. Yeah, I did not know. That she was, you know, such a humanitarian and did so much good yeah. for New Orleans and the area. Yeah. So before this was your main precept of Marie Laveau from the song. What was that song? Marie Laveau. How'd it go? Oh, oh gosh. Was the it? one by... Ah! Oh, down the... Oh, crap. Another man done or something like that. Ooh, another man done gone or That's something. What it, yeah. yeah I can't, who sang that? Was it Jim Stafford, I think? I could never. I love that song, but yeah, yeah, that's kind of the the mental image, you know, this ugly, creepy witch looking woman who put curses on people like that, you know. Mm -hmm. And then you come to find out she did all this wonderful healing, helping work, and she was gorgeous. Yeah. And I, you know, that that kind of. Who knew? That kind of exemplifies what that part of Louisiana is, is, is to me, maybe. And again, maybe I'm just being prejudiced of the area without being hourly prejudiced, but like the, the idea of the swamp being odd, being creepy, yeah, filled with things that will kill you, Bad yet things. oddly enticing. Woo! <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, no, we can't, we can't end the episode without talking about the Skeleton Key, the, mov- the movie The Skeleton Key. I don't with, think I've um, seen that. Stephen King movie? Yeah. The, yeah. No, not the, that Skeleton Key. Oh, well, I don't know then. With um, Goldie Hawn's daughter. Kate Hudson. Come Kate on. Hudson. With Kate Hudson. And then it had um, John. Cusack. Oh, my God. No, not Cusack. Oh, I'm going to kick myself for this wow. because he's one of my favorite actors. Everybody knows this man from something. I know him best from the movie Aliens or Alien. Uh, John, he's the first one to have Alien come out of his chest. Uh, he was also in, um, he was also Ollivander in, in Harry Potter. No. Oh, John Hurt. Oh, John Hurt. John Hurt. Uh, so the movie had Kate. Let's recap because of all of our ill, 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 Ill preparation. It had Kate Hudson and John Hurt in it. And uh, that was a great movie. I think that was a pretty good movie, too. Um, and you should check it out. I, it came out a while ago. So if we were to talk about it, you are far past spoiler alert territory. But um, let's not talk about it and let people watch it. So if you haven't seen it, go watch Skeleton Key. That's a great show. Um that kind of delves into that and there's a oh. twist at the end and it grabs you and you go oh no well don't tell me the twist i'm no. not that's why i said i'm not but all right straight up oh no at the end you're like yes yeah whenever i whenever i see a twist in a movie like yes yes every time because like it had me because if i can guess it I'm like, i guess oh yeah see that's me but when you can what, what you know yep if you totally twist, switch it around you're like what what but movie but the it's usual be with, suspects yes like the end of that i was like oh hell no but or it, um what was the one with Bruce Willis 
with a little the, the little Sixth boy. Sense. Sixth Sense. I was yeah. just gonna say, aside from it, well, it it needs to be within reason because some M Night Shyamalan movies, which that is the well, first yeah, of, yeah, yeah, go in a direction that you do not even know in, and then it gets it gets me in the wrong way. Yeah. But that was his first movie. Um, I think most popular movie was Sixth Sense. It won just a butt ton of awards. Uh, so. Uh, skeleton key, and then there's one other thing I think I wanted to bring up. I thought I wanted to bring up. Nope, it's gone. Thought I had it. It's gone. No, nope. it's gone. <laughs> it was just a, it was just an aside. It wasn't oh, anything oh. big. Okay. But, yeah, but please, if you if you took nothing else from this podcast today, this episode today, um, go to New Orleans, check get, out Coops, get etouffee, get etouffee, and um, be respectful. Beignets with. Marie Laveau. And... Be respectful of that. Yep. Check out Shake Off the Devil by Ethan Brown. Uh, check out those uh, the YouTube documentaries from the History Channel on Zach and Addy. Check that out. Um, if you guys have anything to add, please get at us. We yeah. have an email that no one ever uses. Please use it at Supernatural Tendencies Podcast at gmail.com. Right? Am I right on that one? Absolutely. Got it first try. Be sure to join our Facebook page. Please do it. Because, I'm trying to get to yes. you. If you hear this five years from now, I'm still trying to get to you right now. So if you run a backlog and you hear this, us, I'm talking to you. You kind of sound like Gary V right there. Person in the future. Person in the future. Trying to get to you. Get to you. You need to come to me. I'm going to get to you. So join that group. Give us a like on Facebook. We do have, and we have had for a while now, but we want to emphasize that we are working on it, getting a little more flashier. A a Wix website. Um, We're still... Still on the fence of whether or not we like this Wix website, but again, like we had stated before on a little bit As about your As the donations host, come in, we will be able to incorporate that all into a paid website yep. and be able to offer a lot more yep. things. Until then, we have financial obligations elsewhere, so uh, some of the stuff that we like to be like to be getting into is kind of slow going, so... Uh, we do have that donation page up. If you'd like to do it, it's twenty five dollars. You get a you get a T shirt for your donation. We'll send it to you. Uh, free free shipping costs. Fifty dollar donation if you would uh, see fit. We have a hoodie available for you uh, as a thank you for that. Again, shipping uh, totally covered by us. Um, do not feel obligated at all for that. Like we've said before, um, we're just trying to upgrade some stuff. I know, like I said, I'm trying to get this place soundproofed. We have moved studio rooms to help that. Uh, we do have some ideas on some soundproofing, but there is only a certain amount we can do within the financial range that we have right now. So if you'd like to expedite, help us expedite that process, then feel free to donate. If not, just listen to the podcast. Yes, we definitely appreciate our listeners. We think you are all so amazing. Thank you so and much. And like we said before, you know, we have a Facebook page, which is going to be, we're working on this now, um, bringing lots of live shows uh, that cover all aspects of the paranormal realm. So we have that coming up, and we also have our Facebook group. Uh, so be sure to join that. You can interact directly with us in the group, and um, you'll find lots of really cool posts in there about haunted places, cryptids, UFOs, aliens, well... You guys know the gambit. Yep. We do have, like she kind of alluded to a minute ago, uh, we do have live shows, weekly live shows. Uh, as of now, we only have one person kind of locked in. She's done her first show last week, did a great job. She will be doing it again this week. She's on every Wednesday at 8. That is Miss Cynthia Repke with her Witchy Weeds. Awesome if you're into show. any any herb education for uh, medicinal purposes within reason, please consult your physician, as well as any folklore around all the things that she does. Um Again, witchy things as well with those weeds. Tune in Wednesdays at 8 on our on our podcast page. We are trying to line up some other shows as well. I think we have maybe some people interested in cri- doing the show on crystals. Um, if you happen to be interested in something that you are in and you'd like to do a live show, please contact us at the aforementioned email, Facebook groups, any way you can get a hold of us. We are looking for for hopefully a show a day. Every week. At least, yeah. Yep. So if get you, at us. Yep, get if us you, up. If you are free Mondays and you have something that you like to do, talking about something supernatural, paranormal, of the like, get a hold of us. If you if you have Mondays off, we'll give you a Monday to do. Uh, if you have Tuesdays off, Wednesdays so far is the only one taken. We can work it out. So let us, let us know. Other than that, I think that wraps it up. That's it. We'd like to say thank you one more time for hopping on board with us this week. If you have any comments, questions, critiques or suggestions for new topics, please send us an email 
at Supernatural Tendencies Podcast at gmail.com. We also encourage you to get over to our Facebook page at Supernatural Tendencies Podcast and go ahead and elbow drop that like button for us. We're also available on Instagram at Supernatural Tendencies Podcast and Twitter at Weird and Scary, if that's more to your liking. Please pass us around to your friends as well, where they can find us on Apple Podcasts, CastBox, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and most other podcast platforms. And remember, if you're having any type of paranormal activity or extraterrestrial contact, I offer private coaching online via Skype or Facebook Messenger to assist you with those issues. Feel free to visit me at christyjohnsonsadler.com for contact information. Till next time, this has been Alex and Christy. See you later. And here we are with another musician spotlight for this week. We have Booback, and I am excited about Booback. I was excited about Booback the first time I heard him. Um, and real quick, I've heard other people say Boobak, so however you want to say it, because I haven't been corrected by them yet. Um, I think that's a pretty badass name. Booback, yeah. Yeah, I like it. B-U-B-A-K, yeah. if you need to look it up. And I want you to look it up. Uh, they are from Ypsilanti, Michigan, and and my band had the pleasure of playing with them. Up in uh, Toledo, as uh, we tend to play shows there in Toledo. And Booback uh, blew me away. Not many bands, like, blow me away the first time I see them. Um, I hadn't really heard a lot of their stuff before we played with them, but I'll tell you, they hit the stage. A two-man group. There's a bass player and a drummer, and they do uh, stoner doom metal to the likes of which you have rarely seen. So if you ever get the chance to see Booback, um, I try to look up some of their shows um, on their Facebook to see what they have upcoming. Unfortunately, I'm not sure if they're booked anytime soon. So uh, please check in regularly with them um, in the Michigan, Ohio, Indiana area. I'm not sure if they go far out beyond that. Um, but if you get a chance to check them out, they are fantastic. Do you do you have any thoughts on Boo Bag? Like, what did you first think of when I showed you showed you the song? Um. Well, first, it really, I thought their artwork was really cool when you showed oh, me. Yeah, yeah I, I was like, whoa. That's a, one of the things that they were setting up their merch table right next to ours. And before they even went on, I'm like, dude, that is so. That is awesome. That is sweet uh, artwork. Yeah. Done by, uh, I believe, a Detroit artist named oh, really? Tony Farrow. Oh, wow. So if you get a chance to look up Tony Farrow, that's F-E-R-O. On Facebook, he does comic stuff, illustrations and stuff like that. I think he has his own. Comics Super that he talented. that he publishes or at least illustrates. Check out Tony Farrow as well because I know Booback pushes Tony Farrow, and that was the first thing I noticed too when they're setting their merch stand. Is I love the colors on it. I love the style. So you noticed it as well. Oh yeah, I thought it was it. awesome. Yeah. What about the music? Um, yeah, I liked it. I liked it. Uh, it it's definitely like you said, kind of stoner doom type. What's well, a great dual purpose for this sh- this show, Supernatural Tendencies podcast and the band Booback, is if you listen to Booback's lyrics, uh, they're very they're very like space oriented. I know, yeah, they are a stone doom a stoner doom band, so they have they have a song called Space Weed, but they also uh, incorporate different other things as well. They have a song where they talk about the Anunnaki. Really? Yeah. So you'll you have to check deeper into that, and if that interests any of you all, if you like stoner music, if you like doom metal, and if you like space myth space mythological dankness, check out Booback because it's fantastic. In fact, you're gonna check out Booback right now, but check further into them. Get them at uh, at Bandcamp. I will post some links to their Bandcamp. Buy a song. Buy all the songs. This is Biograde. <laughs>